Did you vote for Trump this time, or did were you voting against? No, Biden? I think he was doing a good job. I think he did a very good job for the last four years. He's done more than most presidents do in, in eight. And unfortunately, the virus came where we would there would be no question on who would be reelected. The only thing the Democrats have is that he didn't take care of the of the virus of the virus. But I don't know what else he could have done. Hi, everyone. My name is Cristina Dolores Miles Hernandez de la Casa de Cárdenas Rodríguez, and I am a first-generation Mexican-American living in Portland, Oregon. I am so happy that you're here and that you're joining me on this journey because I've decided to make a podcast with my parents. These are just the questions that any unaccompanied minor have to answer. The first one is, will you state your name your age, and the country of your birth. Well, you, you know that. My name is Rudolph Miles. What's your full name? I'm, seven, I'm 72. The country of my birth is the United States of America. Will you tell me your full name? Rudolph Martin Miles. I started recording conversations with my parents in October of 2020 during the COVID pandemic as a way to sort through some feelings. Um, and so... This podcast is a place for me to reflect on conversations that I was never brave enough to have with my parents. A little bit of history, I guess, I want to share with you is that uh, my relationship with my parents has always been, I don't know, um, formal. <laughs> that day that Estella and I had the giggles, remember? One time that we were just laughing, laughing, laughing. Oh, yeah. Estella is my daughter. She's eight. And I turned around and she's smiling, uh -huh. sitting there. So I took a picture. It's a real cute picture of her smiling. No, that's not true. Um, I mean, there have been periods in my life where I have felt super close to them. and But as of late, and especially in the past maybe 10 years, it has felt more um, formal parental child than um, friends relating to one another. So this podcast is a way for me to discuss with my parents, um, my dad in particular, politics and systemic racism, and to ask my mom about our, I don't know, our roots, where she came from, what her experience was like being an immigrant into this country. Um, so here we are. We're about to delve in to my family relationships, my family's history. We're going to spill some tea. And I may be learning some things that I don't want to know about my family and their beliefs about myself. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And um, I'm doing it publicly because somehow that's giving me the courage to have these conversations. So thanks for being here. Thanks for giving me the courage to talk to my parents and to maybe even have the courage to be vulnerable and show up and develop a relationship with them. So welcome to Conversations with My Parents. So I decided to ask my parents the 40 questions inspired from research um, for a show that I'm working on with my theater company. The book is called Tell Me How It Ends, an essay in 40 questions by Valeria Luiselli. The 40 questions are from an intake form that she did while working, volunteering as a, an interpreter with a nonprofit who she got in contact with through the American Immigration Lawyers Association. And the nonprofit that she worked with was called The Door. Their website is door.org, D-O-O-R.org. And they are awesome nonprofit operating out of Brooklyn, New York. And their mission has to deal with like helping kids reach their potential. And they are offering legal and immigration services, which is how Valeria Luiselli got hooked up with them. There's something about these questions that I thought it might be interesting for me, my mom, and my dad to answer as a way to contextualize the introduction for this very first conversation and that I'm having with my parents. I don't think I've ever talked to my parents for an hour each, and so these questions were it. Okay, I'm now okay. recording. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you for agreeing to talk to me. 
Um, I sent you the questions, and I also... Are, were, do you have any issue with any of the questions I want to ask? No. Are you going to ask me all of them? I don't know. There's some. The, uh, the, the, There's some at the beginning that don't really apply to me. These are just the questions that any unaccompanied minor have to answer. And I think it's like there's something that I that is really interesting to me, and I'm going to be answering them, and I'm going to ask you some of them. The first one is, um, would you please state your name, your full name, your age, and your country of birth? Marina Miles, 72 years old, and country of birth, Mexico. Where in Mexico? I was born in Mexico City, and then when I was three years old, my dad was uh, had just uh, become a doctor, and he decided that they wanted to come and live in Juarez. So from age three on, I lived in Juarez until I got married at 18. Okay. Uh, when did you enter, or when did you come to the United States? I came to the United States when I got married in 1966. Why? Why? Because <laughs> I married a man that was an American citizen, and I was a Mexican citizen. Right. So I was going to, I married him, and I was going to come live in the States. Got it. Did anyone hurt or has anyone hurt, threatened, or frightened you since you came to the United States? Uh, other than the current president, no. <laughs> and now, good old dad. Will you state your name, your age, and the country of your birth? Well, you, you know that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Rudolph Miles. What's your full name? I'm, seven, I'm 72. Country of my birth is the United States of America. Will you tell me your full name? Rudolph Martin Miles. Gorgeous. Has anyone hurt, threatened, or frightened you in the United States? Not really. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, because we're voice recording, I just want to say that my dad shrugged his shoulders sarcastically to me on the image. So let's start with my mother, who is an immigrant from Mexico. I had never heard about her immigration experience, and, and I was curious. I remember very little from it, but having talked to her about it, I started to remember having memories of things I haven't thought of since, I don't know, ever. But I started to remember a little bit more. Like, I remember now the day we celebrated, the day that she became a citizen when she took her oath. So you... You married dad, and then you became a legal resident. Right. And you got your papers, which means green card. Right. And I had that until 1982 that I became an American citizen because many wanted me to become a citizen. Many, who my mom is talking about here, is her youngest brother and was very close to my mom, my mom being the eldest of her eight siblings and many being the youngest. So it's my mom's baby brother. Many wanted me to request him to, because he wanted to join the Navy. And were you still married at that point or had you, had, had you been? Yeah, 1982. Mm -hmm. We got separated in 84. So, so I'm glad I became a citizen because that helped me when I went through university and all that. I wasn't considered a foreign student. Yeah, totally. Which you would have been had you been a resident. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the time Manny got his papers, 17 years later from when I requested that he get papers... He was already too much into the uh, diplomatic service in Mexico that he didn't want to come. He didn't want to get, get him. So, okay. So you were you got married. You became a resident, which means green card. And then in 1982, you applied for citizenship. Right. And what did that entail? That entailed that I had to study for the test and take the test. It takes, I think you have to do five years of residency before you can apply to citizenship. And when I applied, everybody was questioning me. 
every pe person that I had interviews, why I had waited so long. I said, well, I just didn't think about it. So uh, I had to study, take the test, and go do the ceremony. And I, on the same day that I did the ceremony, I went to the same federal building to request many papers. And he didn't get them until 17 years later. And wait, well, but what does that mean, request papers? What does that mean? As, a, as an American citizen, I could, could I had to, I have the right, if I wanted to, to request that my sister, my brother, my uh, uh, my mother would um, that they would get papers to come across, become residents to start the immigration process for them. To start to start the immigration process for them. And yes. it took seventeen years, so nineteen eighty two. 17 years. So he didn't get his papers until 1999? Am I doing my math correctly? Yep. 17. Okay, 1982, 92, 99. Yes, you did your math correctly. Yay! <laughs> I'm historically bad at math, everyone, just so you know. Uh, great, yes. <laughs> wow. So, And then he was already a diplomat, so he did not take his papers. 17 years. He did. And none of your other years. none of your other siblings or your mom after Vito after your dad died, n nobody ever requested that you did it for them either. No. Um, so I'd like to start with our current president and his administration's focus on the border, where we were raised, and the policies that were being implemented for refugees and asylum seekers at the border. So I'm wondering if you would feel comfortable sh sharing your feelings about the refugee crisis on the border. Yeah, I, I don't mind sharing. I feel that times have changed. There's terrorism in the world. And with the enabling of people to travel around the world very quickly and get wherever they want very quickly, uh, you don't know where the terrorists are going to come from. Uh, an example, the 9-11, the terrorists all came in from Canada and they crossed the border. They came to the United States with the intent of doing harm to the United States. Right now, with the cartels very prevalent in, in Mexico and Central America, it's very easy for terrorists to infiltrate through the Mexican border. So there has to be some type of a vetting that goes on to the immigrants or the United States would not be safe. And I wouldn't feel safe if there wasn't a vetting process. Now, whether the vetting process has gone overboard or not, I'm not sure, I'm not involved in that. But you do have to have some type of vetting to make sure that terrorists don't infiltrate the United States. As far as the children, it has become more prevalent for people to use children in, as sex slaves. And so you've got to vent the children, make sure that they're not being abused or used in some type of a, a trade, sex slave, sex trade. And so there is a lot more questions and a lot more due diligence before you allow asylum seekers into the United States. If that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And part of my interest in starting to work on this show with my company, um, my company, Portland Experimental Theater Ensemble, we're work we've been working on a show called Fronteriza, The Borderlands, since 2018, since families were beginning to be separated at the border. Um, because my hometown, El Paso, Texas, was in the news on a daily basis and the rhetoric around it was false. And I just felt the need to combat the narrative um, that the border is a dangerous place because while there is danger there, it, it is not dangerous, right? There's danger everywhere. You walk outside, there's danger. So I really just felt passionate about setting the narrative straight about what it is to grow up on the border. I grew up in a place that 
was magical that held two countries in one place, right? America and Mexico. And I traversed the border many times, multiple times a week. And I, I have family still to this day, right now, I still have family that straddles this imaginary division between people. It doesn't feel that way, or at least it didn't feel that way growing up in El Paso. It felt like two countries, one community. And in fact, I know El Pasoans still believe that, that we're one community. El Paso Juarez. It feels like one big city. I don't know if it was my awareness or if it was the swiftness that these policy changes occurred, but it was like viewing Border Patrol as um, comrades, as neighbors, as friends, into viewing them now as a part of a like almost militarized as, as a section of the government that were dangerous. I've just progressively been watching this city of mine, right? El Paso, this literally translates to the past, becoming more and more a militarized zone, a place where you have to prove your worth to pass through. You told me you used to, like, when you were little... In, like, elementary school, you would just walk across the border to, like, go to your cousin's house, right? No. No, I mean, we'd get dropped off. But, I mean, not when we were little. When we were little, one time when we were at Jaime's house, he lived, like, three blocks from the bridge. And we decided to go to my house. And we walked. And I was probably six at the oldest. And Jaimito, Pepe, Danny, and I decided just to walk, so we crossed to the U.S. side. And, of course, the U.S. Customs stopped us and wanted to know who our parents were. We told them, and Dad came and picked us up. He had to come get you? They didn't just let you walk? Of course. Oh. Yeah, we were just poor little kids. <laughs> the customs was way different back then. Yeah, I'm interested in, what was it like? Uh, there were, you know, there, there wasn't a, any terrorism to speak of. So your customs officials were there mainly to enforce the customs laws on trade and the immigration laws. I remember one time we were going to go to my uncle Jaime's ranch in Mexico, and we were going to leave from his house in Juarez. Jaimito and I were going to drive. We must have been 16, and we wanted to take a rifle, a 22, and some ammunition. And so we packed up the truck, drove to the U.S. Customs, they asked us what we had. We have a rifle and some ammunition. Where are you going? We're going to go to my uncle's ranch. You know, on the Mexican side, we're just going to use the U.S. for to get over there. And I said, okay, no problem. Coming out of the ranch, there was a crossing with a gate, and they didn't open on Sundays or Saturdays. It was just a trailer on the U.S. side and a house on the Mexican side. And so you would bring your car out on Friday, put on the U.S. side, tell the U.S. Customs we're going to cross on Sunday. And they say, okay, and you just jump the fence. Like a chain link Oops. fence or what? No, a gate. You just climbed over it. It was, you know, like, uh, like a cattle fence. So you just went through it, and you had your car on the U.S. side, so you just drove away, and the cowboy took the truck back to the ranch. But you told the U.S. Customs we're going to cross, and there was no issues. Right. Back, back then, was, was the entire border, did it have a fence? It's always had a some type of a of a fence to de de delineate between the United States and Mexico. Even in the desert. Yes, hmm. but people could you know cross it by just going under it or through it, except for the rivers. The river there was no fence. Who did you live with in Mexico? I lived with my parents in uh, Juarez. Like I told you, we lived in Mexico City for three years, and then we moved to Juarez, and then I got married when I was 18. So I lived with them for 15 years, and then I came to this country. I've been in this country 53 years, almost 54. So more, yeah. you lived in this, this country more than you ever lived in Mexico. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. When your parents were alive, did you stay in touch with them? Yes, I used to visit until after my dad died. Uh, I stopped going when uh, the last time I went to my mom's house, 
I was driving this fancy car. Remember the red car we had? Mm -hmm. and, it was like a Chrysler uh, Imperial, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Two buses. Uh, uh, intentionally scare the heck out of me. I got to my mom's and I was shaking, shaking. What did they do? Did they... Because they they tried to push me from behind, and then one came up in the front and just stopped head to head. And they would laugh. The, the drivers would laugh. But see, it was a fancy car with license plates from El Paso. And they don't like gringos over there. And they don't like Mexicans that have come to live in the States. So I felt like I was being attacked, and I never wanted to go back. Uh huh. That makes sense. So you never went back to visit your mom in person because you were threatened nope. going back. Right. And when was that? When did that happen, Mom? Oh gosh, Oof. years, years, years. My mom still lived for many years, so Diana would bring my mom and they would visit. I'm sure you remember that that they would come all the time. Yeah, at I've, least once a week. Yeah, I had a like I have a distinct memory of like when Vito was still alive, and then like not much later, after, like you just said, and I never knew why, but like I had a distinct memory of going to Juarez every week. Yeah. And for Christmas, Christmas Eves, right? Like having to go to Grandma's early so we could leave by eight or nine, so we could get to Juarez by ten, and do Christmas Eve at Gaki's, but. And then I remember, like, I don't know why we stopped, but then I was like, we stopped going for some reason. And Diana, and then I only saw Diana and Kaki. Yeah. So. That's why. Listening to my mom tell that story, I, re I vividly remember the car. It was the last purchase that my dad made for my mom. And it was a car that we had for a very long time after my parents got divorced. Um, and it was a source of pride. My mom loved that car. <laughs> so hearing this story, like, I do remember going to see my grandmother every week and then it abruptly ending. And I vaguely remember my mom being flustered about how it was dangerous to cross the border. This was probably late 80s, early 90s. Women have been disappearing in, the, in Juarez and in the, the desert. I think my mom just felt that. So now I'm wondering if you will tell me our family myth. Walk me through how we got our Miles name, like the name Miles. Because it's not, it's not our blood, blood, our bloodline name, right? Correct. What would have been our bloodline name? The original name was Soto, and Grandpa was born in Torreon. They had a, like a hardware store in Torreon, and somehow when Grandpa was like two or three, he was playing in the warehouse, and nobody knows what happened, but there was an explosion of whether it was... At the, the Mexican troops had been storing some of their grenades and dynamite and, you know, their, their, their ammunition, rifle and stuff. Yeah. Their munitions in the warehouse. And somebody thinks that somebody dropped a box and there was an explosion in the warehouse. And supposedly that's when grandpa's father, Dr. Soto, was, got killed. And grandpa had a big scar on his leg from that explosion. And after that happened, some time later, Lita and Grandpa and Minerva moved to Presidio, Texas, or Okinaga on the Mexican side, Okinaga, Chihuahua, and to be with her cousins, which were the Noriegas, <laughs> and that's where <laughs> Lita ended up marrying Miles, Martin Miles, and they moved to El Paso. Sorry, so so Lita met Martin Miles, and then, and then they moved to El Paso. up with the last name Miles and have been told many times and in various stages of my life Miles isn't Mexican but I'm told I'm 100% Mexican. My good friend co-artistic director and 
director of Fronteriza, Rebecca Lingefelter, sent me the link to a podcast called Code Switch, the episode We Aren't Who We Think We Are, Leah Danella's story. This is a quote from her podcast on Code Switch. Every family has a myth, and in some cases, an entire mythology about where they came from and who they are. And there are a lot of reasons people tell these stories. Sometimes it's because they genuinely don't know the truth, so they exaggerate, or they make something up. Sometimes it's to make your family seem like they were a part of an important historical event. Sometimes it's to skirt around a shameful history, and other times it's to hide something that's too painful to talk about. So Lita met Martin Miles, and then, and then they moved to El Paso. Correct. Do you know what, why they left Presidio? To move to El Paso? My understanding is that Lito got into an altercation in a bar. And, and Lito is Martin Miles. Right. Okay. And his opponent in the altercation ended up dying. And in order to avoid jail time, they left to El Paso. Got it. The Nodiegas were big in, in law enforcement on the Mexican side. Got it. Why El Paso? Do you know why they chose El Paso? The largest city, closest. What did Lito do in for business? Uh, from the time I could remember, he was the night watchman at Asarco. At so he was in law enforcement. Your youngest sibling, Aunt Carol, my Aunt Carol, she shared, she's been interviewing all the people that had some sort of tidbits of information about Grandpa or about how we got this name. And she wrote down a version of this story that included, I don't know, some some more details. Like, I think from my memory, Dad, this, this the one that Aunt Carol wrote is insinuating that, you know, Lito, Martin Miles, got into a fight and killed a man. Right. Yeah. And so then, but he hadn't, like, in this in this written narrative, and I think from the written story that Carol has, I get the sense that the Noriegas are trying to take care of their cousin, and so it's like the policeman introduced Martin Miles to Lita and said, if you marry her and take I don't, I don't know if that's when, yeah, I don't know if that's when they met or they already knew each other or whatever, but they ended up getting married and moving to El Paso. You know, but I mean, as far as when it happened or how it happened, I don't know. Uh-huh. It could have been that. It could have been that. But they had a good relationship, right? Like, they were they were happy. They were happily married. They were married for how long? Do we know how long they were married? I would guess 60 years. And, like, to your knowledge, it was a happy marriage? Yeah, they were together. Have you talked to any of the siblings that you talk to on a regular basis? Danny, Mike, Ceci? Do you know how what their feelings on Carol's version of the story? Like, how they feel about it? They may not agree with it. But what makes you think they may not agree with it? Growing up, uh, some of some of the siblings did not believe that we were Hispanic. I mean, Mexican. They oh. said, or at least we were half Anglo, because our last name was Miles. <laughs> some of your siblings, my aunts and uncles, don't believe that we're Mexican. Oh, completely Mexican. Why would they want that rather than the truth? I don't know. That you'd have to ask somebody else. We are 100 percent or I am 100 percent and you are 100 percent of Mexican descent. Growing up, people pointed it out to me often, like Miles isn't Mexican, and we have this joke, like when somebody says that to you, what do you say, Dad? I'll give you an example. We filed when the Miles group filed for his, for a minority status, we had to have Mexican, okay. The Miles Group was my dad's, my father and his brother's um, business that he started in response to another business that my grandfather had started for him and his sons. My grandfather was a custom broker. He ran a business called Rudolph Miles and Sons. My dad was one of those, was the eldest of those sons, and he and his brothers started the Miles Group, which was not only the custom broking, but then started warehouses, custom broking, personnel for the businesses, and then a trucking company as well. Uh, Ford was the one that was going to be our sponsor, and they sent somebody down to El Paso to look us over. They went back to Detroit with a report that said, yeah, we were Mexican. And then I got called up there to go meet with the head guy for their minority 
department, which was a guy by the name of Mr. White. And so I left to go meet with him at one o'clock on a day. I left on, a, on the red eye at five o'clock in the morning, got there in time for the meeting. He made me wait for about a half hour before he saw me. And then he looked at the papers when I walked into his office and he kept looking at me and looking at the paper. And he says, Miles is a Mexican. And his name was Mr. White, I still remember. And he was black. And I said, well, white isn't black. <laughs> and we got approved. Right. I mean, what's in the name? When your brother Martin was in a spelling bee, the Spanish spelling bee as a Spanish speaker and the English speaker from the same class was last name was Cordero. They thought they had messed it up. Yes. And, and they said, are you all messed up? I mean, you can't be the Spanish speaker and you can't be the non-Spanish speaker. And Martin said, no, I speak Spanish. And Cordero said, no, I don't speak Spanish. So what is the name? I know the family joke that, that when someone points out our name isn't Mexican, you just tell them that they're pronouncing it wrong. And it's really pronounced miles. <laughs> Okay, um, I think that's all of my questions that I have. See, Woo, we did it. We did it in like 50 minutes. Good. I can just watch the Cowboys. Oh, you get to go watch the guests. You can go watch your football. No. <laughs> I'm joking. I know. It'll start for another 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dad. So there it is. Some conversations that I never would have had, now we've had them. I heard for the first time what it was like for my mom being an immigrant. I heard a story that I vaguely remember and understand now why we stopped going to Mexico, to Juarez. I heard from both of my parents the sense of violence that as a child I don't remember in either Juarez or in El Paso, but I, I guess reminiscing with them there was a sense of it. I'm so grateful and so proud to be from El Paso that it's hard for me to reconcile that it wasn't anything but magical. Living on the border was a gift that I carry with me always because it's given me this ability, maybe, to hear my dad, to hear the opposing point of view, but doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. So I'm reckoning with my political beliefs versus the stories being told by my parents. So next time, we're going to talk about our identities and what it means to be a Mexican-American along the border in this country. So I hope that you'll come back and you'll listen to me talk with my parents and talk about how we identify ourselves and maybe unpack some terms like POC, BIPOC, Latinx. Spoiler alert, my parents have never heard of any of those. Anyway, thanks for joining me on Conversations with My Parents.